this morning as we tune into John chapter 16, verses 25 to 33. So let's turn to John chapter 16, verses 25 to 33. Once you have it, let's all stand as we read and depend on the word of God together this morning. John chapter 16, <clears throat> verses 25 to 33. Verse 25, I have said these things to you in figures of speech. The hour is coming when I will no longer speak to you in figures of speech, but will tell you plainly about the Father. In that day you will ask in my name, and I do not say to you that I will ask the Father on your behalf. For the Father himself loves you, because you have loved me and have believed that I came from God. I came from the Father and have come into the world, and now I am leaving the world and going to the Father. His disciples said, Ah, now you are speaking plainly and not using figurative speech. Now we know that you know all things and do not need anyone to question you. This is why we believe that you came from God. Jesus answered them, Do you now believe? Behold, the hour is coming. Indeed, it has come when you will be scattered each to his own home and will leave me alone. Yet I am not alone, for the Father is with me. I have said these things to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulations, but take heart. I have overcome the world. This is God's word. Thanks be to God. You guys may be seated. Joe, pray with me one more time. Lord, we ask of you this morning to speak to us very clearly this morning. Although we might be in different stages in our journey with you, the one thing that unites us together is that we are desperately in need of your truth this morning. Lord, we confess that throughout the week, uh, our hearts and our minds are bombarded with counterfeit fake, false truths, if you will, uh, according to the worldly desires. But Lord, we ask of you, as your disciples, uh, we desire to really align our lives and our hearts to your will and to your word. So speak to us clearly this morning, and maybe a time of joy, maybe a time of refreshment, maybe a time where we are challenged and convicted yet again. Uh, with your word this morning. We love you, Lord. We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, if you guys are taking notes, the title of today's message is Confessions of an Honest Disciple. Confessions of an Honest Disciple. For most of us, uh, I think for all of us, we've either uh, been to school or we are either still in school. And in school, one thing that we are taught from a very young age is the skill of memorizing, skill of memorization. Whether it's to remember your grocery list before you go to Costco or materials that you quickly cram before your upcoming exam the night before, there are many different strategies to remember the variety of facts and ideals we need to retain. So then how many times does one need to repeat listening to something or someone in order for one to remember or to engrave something into their memory? For some of us, we have really gifted memorizing skills. So we only need to listen to it a few times and we can remember it. If you're like me, you need multiple, multiple uh, attempts to memorize even something as simple as a phone number or an address. Uh, to be honest, in my personal opinion, I don't think memorizing has much to do with the information, but rather it depends a whole lot more on the listener. Let me say that again. I don't think the memorizing aspect has a lot to do with information, uh, but rather it depends a whole lot more on the attitude of the listener. For example, if, they lis if the listener views the information as something that is very important to them, they will listen very intently to make sure that even if it's their first and only time hearing, they will make note or come up with any and every strategy possible to remember and engrave into their memory, right? Let's say, for example, um, 
someone gives you the winning numbers for the lottery ticket that will win you $12 million, but you will only hear it once. More likely than not, you will do whatever it takes to make sure that you remember that winning lottery number. However, if it's something that does not interest you as much, even if it's repeated five times, 10 times, or even 100 times, you will have difficulty in remembering them. Perhaps this is why when our parents remind us to do our homework in the past, when we are used to take cla taking classes in a subject that we have no interest in, it was, very, it was, much, it was much more difficult to, re to retain the information from memory compared to, let's say, a phone number of a person that you're interested in or a lottery, a winning lottery ticket number. Perhaps this, uh, in today's passage, I believe we see a very similar case as the very disciples of Jesus Christ thought they knew. They thought they understood all that Jesus had to share. I mean, come on, they were with Jesus for the past three years, all of their life, 24-7. However, Jesus reveals to them today that they did not fully understand. And they did not know what Jesus desired for them to know. Just a quick recap. On the final night, on the final evening of, um, on the final evening of Jesus' life on earth, he spends it very strategically with his disciples and loving them, washing their feet, teaching them and preparing them for the life after Jesus leaves, right? Jesus has been reminding them ever since John chapter 14 that he must depart, that he must leave them behind, referring to what will happen the day after, which is the crucifixion of the cross, right? Jesus was well aware of what was ahead for the disciples after he leaves them. Jesus initially called them to be his disciples, which literally means followers of Jesus, not only up to his death, but even after his death, as his hands and his feet, as extensions of his ministry in carrying out God's mission on earth from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria to the ends of the earth. However, Jesus knew that the journey was not going to be easy. Jesus reminds them that there will be troubles ahead, that on their journey, there will be persecution and hostility. Due to their association with Jesus as his disciples, they will face hardships along the way. This is why Jesus reminds them that he will send a helper and the Holy Spirit to be with them, to empower them throughout their journey. Not only that, we saw last week in how Jesus compares those hardships to uh, birth pains. Although it might seem painful, although it might be difficult at the moment, Jesus encourages his disciples to look forward, to look ahead to the great joy that lies ahead. The joy of new life that far outweighs the troubles that await the disciples tomorrow. Starting with chapter 13, we've taken our time, I think for a few months now, walking slowly but closely with Jesus and his disciples during their final evening together, carefully examining and meditating upon every minor detail of Jesus' final teaching before the cross. Today's passage is actually the last conversation, the last time Jesus will be with his disciples, and the, G and the disciples of Jesus are never to be seen again until Jesus rises again from the dead. And during this last conversation that Jesus has with his disciples, we see that Jesus is at it again, reminding them one last time that he desperately wishes for the disciples to understand. To really know. Look with me in verse 25. I don't think I have it up there. But if you look at it in your Bible, verse 25 says, I have said these things to you in figures of speech. The hour is coming when I will no longer speak to you in figures of speech, but will tell you plainly about the Father. In that day, you will ask in my name. I do not say to you that I will ask the Father on your behalf. For the Father himself loves you. Because you have loved me and believed that I came from God. I came from the Father and have come into the world. And now I am leaving the world and going to the Father. 
I don't know about you, but it seems, as, it seems to me that Jesus is repeating and reiterating himself over and over and over again regarding his departure, regarding his identity and his relationship with God the Father, regarding his mission on earth. Perhaps because for Jesus, there was nothing more important than to prepare his disciples for the journey ahead. He loves his disciples, and he wants for them to be ready for what is ahead. So then how did the disciples respond? After all that Jesus had to share, the disciples confessed, perhaps with too much confidence, overconfidence, that they knew, that they understood, that they believed all that Jesus desired for them to know. I went ahead of myself on the slide, but our first point, basically they're saying, Jesus, we get it. With their overconfident confession, they're saying, Jesus, we got you. We get what you're trying to say. Right? Look with me in verse 29. His disciples said, ah, now you are speaking plainly and not using figurative speech. Now we know that you know all things and do not need anyone to question you. This is why we believe that you came from God. Jesus, we get it. You don't got to repeat yourself anymore. As if Jesus was speaking a different language all this time, the disciples think now, that now they know. Now they believe what Jesus has been talking about all this time. But if we look at very closely at the context of the passage, despite their overconfidence, they didn't know. They didn't really understand. And they didn't really believe. It's as if the disciples have annoyed and grown tired of Jesus repeating over and over again the same thing that doesn't really make sense to them. So rather than humbly admitting that they don't know, that they still don't understand, because that means they'll have to hear it again from Jesus for the thousandth time, they simply respond, Jesus, we get it. You can stop. We know. We know what you're trying to say, so you can stop now. Like when our parents nag us over and over again to do our homework, or when they remind us of our weekly chores to do the dishes, to do wash, or uh, do, do, do laundry, or when someone continually, continuously points out our mistakes over and over and over again. The disciples were fed up and saying, Jesus, we get it. Please stop. No more. The easiest way to respond is with this simple phrase, I know, I know. The disciples concluded that they know, they get it, they believe as they, as, as the, as they simply try to regurgitate everything that Jesus has shared with them from memory. However, if we look very closely in the passage and their response to Jesus, it appears as though most of what Jesus shared stayed only in their head and did not really trickle down and travel to their hearts. Although they confessed with their lips that they know Jesus and that he reveals all things, although they confessed with their lips that Jesus came from God, the overconfident confession was shallow at best and no different from those Jewish religious leaders and what they said about Jesus. Like Nicodemus, if you recall Nicodemus from chapter 3. He was a Jewish religious leader. And he confessed that Jesus had come from God as the teacher. Right? He says, the man came to Jesus, this is Nicodemus, by night and said to him, Rabbi or teacher, we know that you are a teacher come from God. For no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Compare that to the confession of the disciples. Not much different, is it? As they share, we know that you are, we know all things and do not need anyone to question you. This is why we believe that you came from God. The only confession after three years that the disciples could give is, Jesus, we know that you are from God. Even unbelievers knew that Jesus came from God. All they were doing was simply confirming nodding, and regurgitating what Jesus has already shared. 
And judging from their overconfident confession, they were no different than the Jewish religious leaders who thought they knew it all. When in reality, they were simply blinded by their pride. Whether it was because they've grown tired and annoyed of Jesus or their pride, what was important was the fact that despite their overconfident confession, they did not truly understand what Jesus was saying. And I'm willing to bet that there are some of us here this morning who have this similar attitude when it comes to listening a sermon, when it comes to reading a Bible passage. Grown up in church all my life. Yeah, I've read this story. I've heard this sermon before. I don't need to hear it again. Friends, imagine with me, if you were Jesus, how would you feel if you were Jesus? Place yourself in the shoe of Jesus for a minute. I mean, for the past three years, you discipled these guys. You were with them 24-7. You gave your life for these guys. And on the night before your death, when you can be doing anything else, when you can be going to an all-you-can-eat buffet or doing anything else, he decides to choose. He, de- he chooses to spend it with the disciples by washing their feet and preparing them for the journey ahead. Yet in the end, despite their overconfident confession, you see right through their confession and realize that they still do not know. They still do not understand. Maybe because they could care less. What's fascinating is how Jesus doesn't scold them. He doesn't bring out the memistic, right? He does not rebuke them or call them out like he does with the Jewish religious leaders. What does he do? Instead, Jesus graciously challenges the depth, the weight, or perhaps the authenticity of their confession. Look with me in verse 31. Basically, Jesus is saying, do you really know? Jesus answered them, do you now believe? Now, this response in verse 31 from Jesus can be understood in two different ways. It can be understood as a question or it can be understood as an exclamation. As an exclamation, it can mean finally, wow, now, now you believe. It translated in this way, it can mean that Jesus is finally relieved to know that the disciples finally get it. Okay, it's all worth it because after three years, finally they get it. Finally, they understand what I've been trying to say all this time. Or it can be understood as a question, meaning to mean, do you really believe? Do you truly believe? If translated as a question, it gives a sign of concern, reservation, as if Jesus was not satisfied with the response. So which one is it? Is it an exclamation or is it a question? Was he relieved or was he concerned for the disciples? We can find the answer to this question from the following verse in verse 32. Verse 32, Jesus says, Behold, the hour is coming. Indeed, it has come. The hour has come. When you will be scattered, each to his own home, and you will leave me alone. Yet I am not alone, for the Father is with me. Friends, judging from verse 32, we could clearly see that Jesus was concerned. He was not relieved because the disciples finally understood. No, he was concerned. Despite their honest overconfident confession, Jesus reminds them that they still have a long ways to go. And they do not fully understand. They do not know and believe yet the truth that Jesus has been teaching them all this time. Jesus reminds them exactly what's going to happen in a few short hours. Once Jesus is arrested, once he is trialed, mocked, beaten, and crucified on the cross, disciples will not be by his side. Even Peter, who put his life on the line, said, I will never leave you. Even if all these other disciples leave you, I will never leave you. Instead, they will be scattered, hiding, each to his own home. The word here, scatter, 
recalls an Old Testament prophecy from Zechariah, right? Strike the shepherd, Jesus Christ, and the sheep will be scattered. This prophecy is going to be fulfilled as Jesus is crucified on the cross. Although the disciples boasted so confidently to Jesus saying, they know, I got you, Jesus. We get it. We believe. Jesus reveals to them that they don't know. They don't know what Jesus desired for them to know. They only know enough to get by, only enough to follow Jesus up to the cross, or not even as they fled as soon as Jesus is arrested. Despite reminding the disciples over and over again, even in chapter 16 alone, it says hostility is coming, persecution is coming, tribulation is awaiting, waiting. They were not prepared to handle the heat. They were not prepared to handle the persecution and tribulations ahead. It's like saying you studied for an exam and you know the material, but you won't know just how much you really studied until you stand up to the test. And then you give the excuse, man, everything I studied for was not on the exam. It's maybe because you didn't really study and you didn't really grasp the lectures, or the readings. Despite their overconfident confession, Jesus reminds them the shocking reality, the shocking truth that they will eventually flee and scatter like sheep, leaving Jesus all alone as he is crucified on the cross. So the question we got to ask is, what were they missing? What were they blind to? What was the cause of their fleeing and scattering despite their overconfident confession? I believe the answer lies in the following verse, in verse 33. And if we can, if we're able, I would like for all of us to read verse 33 all together out loud. Can we do that? Let's do that. Verse 33. Ready? Go. I have said these things to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulations, but take heart. I have overcome the world. Jesus reminds his disciples yet again the secret, the secret recipe to remaining faithful to Jesus, the secret to not fleeing or scattering when troubles come, the secret to having peace even in the midst of hardships. What is that secret? The secret lies in these two words. In Christ. In Christ. Friends, this is why Jesus emphasized in chapter 15, using the vine and the branch imagery, the importance of abiding not in the world, not in yourself, not in anything else, in Christ. It is only when they are abiding in Christ are they able to bear fruit. It is only when they abide in Christ are they able to love each other. It is only when they abide in Christ are they able to go through hardships, hatred, hostility that are coming their way. And Jesus takes it a step further. He picks it up a notch and he says that you can even have peace, true peace in all circumstances as long as they are in who? In Christ. Jesus promises his disciples that hardships, sufferings, hostility is coming. It's on their way. But they can have peace. They can have peace even in the midst of tough times as long as they are in Christ. Friends, I believe we have a often misunderstanding of what peace uh, ought to look like. Peace does not mean a safer environment. Peace does not mean exemption from hardships and troubles. Although the disciples were able to run away and scatter when Jesus was captured in a safer environment, they would have to live in fear, in hiding. That's not peace. Instead, Jesus is reminding his disciples once again, abide in me. Because there is only one place in all the world where we can have true, everlasting peace. Where? That can only be found in me, in Jesus Christ. You want to experience true, everlasting peace? 
We think if we go to Cancun or Hawaii, or go to Maldives, enjoy a very peace, calm vacation without any troubles for the rest of our lives, that is true peace. No, you will be miserable eventually. God is the one who created us, and he has the key, the answer to true, everlasting peace. And he gives us the answer to the test. What is the answer? The answer is in Christ. Yeah, here we are, so busy, so exhausted and tired, looking for peace elsewhere, anywhere else, but in the answer itself, in Christ. Friends, this peace, that Jesus is referring to is in relation to how we view and understand the cross. Some of us might have jewelry in the shape of a cross. Some of us would like to rock even a tattoo in the shape of a cross. But do we really even know the meaning of the cross? To the world, the cross represented both a curse and a failure. Back in Jesus' times, no one would dare to wear a cross as a necklace or as a jewelry. No one would dare to put a cross uh, as a tattoo on their body. Why? Because it meant a curse and it meant a failure. According to Jewish tradition, the cross was a place for a cursed one. And according to the Hellenistic tradition, the cross was a place for those fake rebels, those who have failed to revolt against the Roman government. To the world, the cross meant complete defeat and uttermost humiliation. However, Jesus reminds his disciples in verse 33 to take heart, to be encouraged, and to see the cross not as a cursed place, not as a place of failure, defeat, and humiliation. No, but rather a place where Jesus is victorious, A place where Jesus overcomes the world. A place where Jesus defeats sin and death once and for all. Verse 33, in the world you will have tribulations. Not you might, not maybe, but you will have tribulations. But take heart. Why? For I, Jesus Christ, have overcome the world. On the final night of his life on earth, Jesus graciously warns his disciples, perhaps even begging them to see the cross, not as a place of defeat, not as a place of humiliation, but a place of victory. It is only when they truly know, understand, and believe this truth about the cross, they are able to find true, everlasting peace as they partake in Christ's victory once and for all. Friends, let me ask you guys, how do we view the cross? It's a nice shape. It looks nice as a necklace or on a tattoo. What is your honest confession before our Lord together, our Lord this morning? How do you view the cross? Do you truly know our Savior and our Lord Jesus Christ? Or do you just nominally pretend, and give him lip service. According to Jesus, anyone can regurgitate or recite what he taught. Anyone can read the Bible and act as though they know and they believe. Even unbelievers are more serious about reading and studying the scriptures so that they can refute against it. But when push comes to shove, friends, Jesus is not interested in fake or nominal disciples who think they know a lot about Jesus, who give him lip service thinking that is more than enough. I'm sorry, but Jesus is not interested in nominal disciples. Instead, he wants to remind each and every one of us this morning what true discipleship ought to look like. When Jesus first called his disciples, he said in Matthew 16, verse 24, if anyone would come after me, if you want to be my disciple, they let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Jesus doesn't simply say, follow me. He says, you must deny yourself, take up the cross, and follow me. 
Friends, if we consider ourselves a disciple of Jesus, a true follower of Jesus, our journey will and should resemble Christ's journey to the cross. We are to deny ourselves, carry our cross, and follow Jesus, the road marked with suffering and shame. Just as Jesus mentioned in verse 33, Jesus does not say to you, you might have tribulation. No, he says, you will. You will have tribulations, meaning it's inevitable. If you consider yourself a follower, a true disciple of Jesus Christ, your journey ahead will have tribulations. Yet Jesus empowers us not to not only focus on our tribulations and hardships that await, but he tells us to focus and be empowered and take courage in him, in Christ, because in the end, assurance and hope will have the last word. Jesus encourages us to take heart because he does not remain dead on the cross. Know what happens? He rises again three days later and has defeated sin and death once and for all. To be courageous, he desires for us to be courageous despite the tribulations, for we have our true peace everlasting in and through Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Friends, are you a follower of Jesus Christ? Do you consider yourself a true disciple of Jesus Christ? If you are, then consider it a blessing, a great privilege for the journey marked out before us. Because it is a journey, yes, marked with, uh, marked with suffering and sh- uh, shame and hostility, yes. But it is also a journey that has already been won and victorious in Christ Jesus, our Lord. As his disciple, as his follower, we are standing upon the shoulders of and his, un- his accomplished work and victory on the cross. We are standing on the bedrock foundation of what Jesus has already done for us on the cross. Meaning the very low, the lowest you can go, the rock bottom that you could hit in your life as a follower of Jesus is on the shoulders of what Jesus has done for us on the cross. I don't know about you, but that sounds pretty good. Pretty hopeful. Christ promises us true peace in him and only in him. So why are we so relentless in trying to pursue true peace elsewhere? For those who do not yet know Jesus Christ, I believe he's inviting you today for the first time, for the fifth time, tenth time, hundredth time, to join him in this victory. You will go through a time in your life, by God's grace, where you are miserable, where you are hopeless, where you have no peace in life. And maybe that is God beckoning you to turn to him. Because he wants to offer you peace everlasting. He wants to offer you true everlasting life. He doesn't disqualify you. He doesn't disqualify anyone because of where you've been, because of what we've done, because of our background. No, in him we are now, what, a new creation. In him, we are a new creation, and in him, we have peace. We can have peace despite the chaos, despite the tribulations of this world, because he has overcome. Friends, he is victorious, and in him, we too are given the privilege to join him in that victory. If you do not believe that Jesus rose again from the dead, I'm sorry, but I don't know what hope you're living with, because we should just close shop. There's no need for us to gather at church. If Jesus remained dead, there's no hope. But Jesus rose again from the dead victorious, meaning even sin and death itself could not defeat Jesus. The devil thought he won because he used his very weapon that everyone was afraid of, death, to end Jesus. But what does Jesus do? He uses the very weapon of the enemy, saying, not even your best shot got nothing on me, as he rose again from the dead. And he's saying, although he has overcome, he does not say we will overcome. He is the only one who has overcome. Yet we can partake in that victory with Christ 
as his disciples. And he's inviting us to a life of victory. Meaning, if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, we are already victorious. We have already overcome the world because of Christ in him. So why are we living a life so defeated? Why are we living a life feeling like we've, we have been overcome by the world? Jesus is saying, remember your true identity in Christ. You are victorious in Christ. You are victorious children of God, purchased by his blood. Let us live wherever we are, in our campuses, in our workplaces, in our families, wherever we are. Let's live as people who have been overcome who have overcome the world through the blood of Jesus Christ. Let's pray together.